Earlier this year, the New South Wales Corruption Commission found that our former Premier Gladys Berejiklian engaged in serious corrupt conduct. But most of what was in that 600 word report was known as far back as 2020. Yet when it became public knowledge that she did nothing when made aware of her sacred boyfriend's blatant corruption, this was how the media responded. She has been courageous, tough and has steered us through the hardest year of our times. But today, Premier Gladys Berejiklian was humiliated and embarrassed as her personal life came tumbling out in a way that shocked even her closest colleagues. There's no one I'd prefer to see leading us through these very difficult times. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. She's one of the hardest working premiers. She's been a steady helm um, during COVID. She's done an amazing... It was a horrible day yesterday. It was really tough to watch. I don't think anyone was expecting to hear that from the premier. Is she OK? Oh, see, I reckon that the public reads this and goes, leave her alone, uh, leave her alone. Um, yes, she had a, a private affair, it's a private matter. Let's keep it as a private matter. A year later, when the Corruption Commission announced they shifted their attention from just her boyfriend to now her, she resigned. Again, this is how they responded. Her leadership made her a poster girl, described by the Financial Review, the woman who saved Australia. But in the end, she couldn't save herself. The Premier was no doubt very popular. In fact, she still is. However, she never pretended to be perfect. Once up, the woman who saved Australia, ultimately, Gladys Berejiklian, couldn't save her own job. We should focus now on what she has done, the great job she's done, and, and say thank you, Gladys. Now, for our US viewers, you would come to expect this sort of cult of personality from your openly partisan networks. In Australia though, most of our networks are officially neutral. However, Aunt Gladys made it abundantly clear that that was a sham. So one of the things that you might have noticed is that people with right-leaning sympathies often complain the of the woke left media, and at the same time, people with left-leaning sympathies complain that the media is controlled by conservative right-wingers. The truth is that both are actually offering a very surface level analysis of what's going on. And before we get into Gladys, I want to illustrate the point here. If you've at all tuned into the Supreme Opposition Leader of Australia, Friendly Geordies, then what I'm about to say will be familiar, but during Gladys's reign, he was the only one pointing this out, and I think it's safe to say that all of his commentary aged like fine wine. So the biggest media mogul in Australia is obviously Rupert Murdoch, and News Corp owns papers like The Australian, Herald Sun and Daily Telegraph on top of news.com.au, and of course Sky News, the Australian sister to America's Fox News. I don't think I need to elaborate too heavily on what Murdoch's directives are, oppose the Labor Party, and play into the culture wars to energise the Liberal Party's voter base. Given my pretty open sympathies for Labor, you might be surprised to hear me say this, but I think this is the most honest system, because for the most part, News Corp outlets don't pretend that they're not biased. It's really no secret who they advocate for, guys like Tony Abbott and now Peter Dutton. Secondly, you have Nine Fairfax. These guys own Channel 9, Australia's most popular TV channel, the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, and Pedestrian TV, basically the Australian version of BuzzFeed. The chairman of Nine Fairfax is ex-Liberal Party treasurer Peter Costello. There's a perception that these are left-wing outlets, but that only really extends to culture war issues like gay marriage and abortion. In New South Wales, it has only once endorsed the Labor Party since 1973, and typically advocate for socially left-leaning Liberal Party members like Malcolm Turnbull, and of course the subject of our video, Gladys Berejiklian. My huge gripe with Fairfax is that they act as though they're intellectually above bias, and many of their readers read with a sense of snobbery as though they too have risen above that bias. So our two biggest media outlets both endorse the Liberal Party, but just appeal to a different flavour of voters. Surely then our third largest media magnate would either be neutral or somewhat pro-Labor. Well, no. Kerry Stokes owns the Seven Network and the West Australian. He's personally donated double what he has to the Liberal Party as to what he has for Labor. Big shout out to Michael West for digging that one up. In Malcolm Turnbull's book, he actually discusses a conversation between Murdoch and Stokes, where he said that Stokes seemed horrified at Murdoch being okay with the Labor government for the short term in 2019. So unlike America, where the big news networks belong to rival parties, in Australia, the big news networks belong to rival factions within the one party. Probably the biggest pro-Labor newspaper in Australia is The Guardian, and I actually couldn't find where it even ranked amongst the biggest newspapers in Australia. 
If you read Chomsky, he offers a pretty simple reason as to why pro working class newspapers can't advertise to people with purchasing power and therefore can't run their papers as efficiently as ones who appeal to a higher income demographic. So as people were debating whether the media landscape skewed left or right, they were missing the real issue. Was it skewed towards one particular party? People who argued that it was were often tarred with the conspiratorial brush by even people like me. But then Gladys Berejiklian came along and made the media machine work so hard to save a reputation that it made the game so abundantly clear to even Wallies like myself. For reference, I still don't know where to find all 1 million coins on that LEGO Star Wars level. So just for historical context, because this is what the channel is primarily about, corruption has always been rampant in New South Wales on both sides of Parliament. For the Libs, it was really bad in the 70s under Bob Askin, and for Labor, it was really bad at the end of the 2000s with Joe Tripodi and Eddie Obeid pulling strings behind the scenes. Because of this, Labor got booted out by a landslide in 2011, and the Libs first had Barry O'Farrell as their leader. In 2014, he had to step down due to an undeclared bottle of wine that was gifted to him from Australian Water Holdings, which was one of Eddie Obeid's affiliated corrupt companies. This then brought Mike Baird to the helm, who appointed Gladys as his treasurer. Very interestingly, Baird had a meeting with Shinzo Abe himself on January the 15th, 2017, and then three days later surprised everyone by resigning. Unfortunately, I can't point you to any particular conspiracy theory, but I'm very confident that we don't have the full story of what actually happened in that meeting. But following this, Gladys Berejiklian stepped forward uncontested and became the premier. And to give her her dues, she was an effective campaigner. She spoke clearly and gave what seemed like no-nonsense answers, which is why it's so weird that she, of all people, had a cult of personality built around her. But when it came to Gladys, I think the first red flag around her leadership that pointed towards what could come later came with the huge hike in needless infrastructure spending. Some of these came under her remit as transport minister and treasurer, and some were approved as premier. For example, existing train lines like the Chatswood to Epping and the Chatswood to Bankstown were scrapped for the Sydney Metro. The Northwestern component cost $8.3 billion, while the Southwestern component went over budget by $3 billion to cost $15.5 billion. It was great news for those in the construction business, and even better for private companies like MTR, John Holland Group, and UGL Rail, who got a 15-year contract to operate and maintain the networks. This was the first privately operated suburban line in the state, not to mention that the Chatswood to Epping trains had about a third of the capacity of what was already there. On top of that, Gladys ignored Infrastructure Australia's warning of a 12% congestion increase to pay $2.9 billion for a light rail in Sydney, which as was warned against, then increased travel times. She spent $1.1 billion moving the Powerhouse Museum to Parramatta, and above all, gave the green light to the West Connects road network. Back in 2018, Gladys approved the sale of 51% of Sydney Motorway Corporation, the company building West Connects, for $9.26 billion. However, the cost of the network rose to be as much as $45 billion as the government had to acquire land. For perspective, Gladys's government sold the right to toll the road for one-fifth of the cost for a road network that in some areas worsened traffic by 300%. Now, I want to be clear. None of this is any evidence of corruption on Gladys's part, and Labor also supported WestConnex. But it's a lot of favours given to private construction companies who got huge contracts to benefit other private businesses. So when Operation Keppel saw a probe into her phone calls with Daryl Maguire, it started to make her complicity in corruption a lot more believable. Nonetheless, the 2019 election was an absolute disaster for Labor. So since 2015, Labor was led by this guy Luke Foley, and he was a reasonably effective opposition leader. Despite being parachuted at the last minute back in 2015, he took 14 seats off Mike Baird, and by Labor's standards, was on good terms with key News Corp figureheads like Alan Jones. However, on the eve of the election, Liberal MP David Elliott raised an allegation that Foley had sexually harassed an ABC journalist while drunk at a party in 2016. Foley resigned immediately, though denied the allegation. This brought Michael Daly to the leadership, who drew attention to Gladys's huge privatisation drive, and said that Labor would put that money towards schools and hospitals. Look, it's no secret I have pro-Labor sympathies, but that was basically this idiom in meme. No, 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 no. Okay, so it's not actually a meme, well, just yet. Get on it whenever you see a vague campaign promise. But on top of that, right before the election, a video surfaced of Daly speaking about highly skilled migrants from Asia replacing the workforce in Sydney. 
the media, even the free speech warriors from News Corp pounced on Daly for its racial undertones and hit Labor in some key electorates. For instance, current Premier Chris Minns' seat in Cogra, an area with a large Nepalese and Chinese voting base, saw a 3% swing against him as he only held on by the narrowest of margins. Seriously, you can re-watch the footage of him stressing really hard on air as it looked like a real possibility that he'd lose his job. But Gladys's message of getting on with the job seemed to land far better than Daly's schools and hospitals and the Liberals cruised to victory. Daly stepped down and was replaced with Jodie McKay. Perhaps what was most impressive was that Gladys united both News Corp and Fairfax behind her. Right-wing culture warrior Alan Jones even said that Prime Minister Scott Morrison needed to copy Gladys's approach for the upcoming federal election. However, later in 2019, the first cracks between the socially conservative News Corp and the socially progressive Fairfax began to emerge over abortion. So Gladys allowed independent MP Alex Greenwich to put forward a bill that removed abortion as a crime under the Crimes Act and allowed all abortions up to 22 weeks and then even afterwards with the consent of two practitioners. The bill was sponsored by Gladys's Health Minister Brad Hazard and Gladys allowed the Liberal Party to have a conscience vote. During the debate, socially conservative ministers went to places like Sky News to voice their opposition to the bill. Fast forward to the end of the year and New South Wales faced perhaps its greatest disaster, the bushfires. Just for perspective, 243,000 square kilometres were burnt down, nearly 10,000 buildings destroyed, 71% of koala habitat gone, 8,000 koalas dead, and then 34 people killed directly by the fires and 445 indirectly by smoke inhalation. Now, obviously, a natural disaster cannot be pointed in the direction of any particular individual. But the Prime Minister was first into the firing line. Famously, he went off to Hawaii as the fires were dramatically worsening and then lied about his holiday. So the bulk of the outrage was directed towards Scott Morrison, but Gladys also creeped into the firing line. Now this bushfire season was largely predictable. 2019-20 was an El Nino summer and climate change had increased the intensity and frequency of the El Nino La Nina cycle. Gladys hadn't instituted a concrete climate policy and so people suggested her lack of action on climate change made the fires worse. And that might be true, but New South Wales' emissions when compared on a world scale would have contributed quite little to exacerbating the cycle. For me, the much stronger criticism was that in 2019, fire chiefs warned her about the dangerous summer ahead and she still went and cut $29.5 million from the Rural Fire Service, which was 35% of their budget. Now, this was done under the guise of fiscal responsibility, but just remember the sums of money that were spent on those Sydney infrastructure projects. With the Liberals clearing 99% of koala habitat since coming to power in 2011, friendly Geordies hit Gladys with the label koala killer in the aftermath of the fires. And this one stuck. So obviously, this was perhaps the worst label an Aussie politician could be stuck with, and Gladys needed to shirk it. So what the Liberals went and did was introduce a quote-unquote koala bill, which would require all local councils to complete a koala management plan. I mean, let's be real, it's effectively outsourcing koala protection to rural local councils, but even still, the Liberals coalition partner, the Nationals, opposed this. Big agri companies were huge Nationals donors and this could have caused non-National held councils to restrict land clearing. So Gladys went to war with the Nationals leader, John Barillaro, in what the media called the Koala Wars. Barillaro threatened to end the coalition if the bill went through. They reached a compromise where landholders could have an easy dispute avenue against the local councils and Gladys's media coverage was glittering. Just look at some of these headlines. Now, obviously, we can't talk about 2020 without, of course, discussing COVID. As a side note, because I made a video that had the title free speech in it, I now have all these weirdly Australian subscribers whose biggest enemy is not Albo or Dutton, but Fauci. <laughs> I'm not going to labour the COVID point here because we all hate talking about it, but unfortunately for Gladys, we have to because she literally was branded as the woman who saved Australia. So COVID started as primarily a federal government issue because it dealt with travel and quarantine. However, once it started to spread, it became a state issue because health is administered at the state level. So in March of 2020, a now infamous cruise ship, the Ruby Princess, left to complete a 13 night cruise of New Zealand. However, while in the town of Napier, the ship was ordered to return home as news emerged that there was a cluster of 16 cases in Napier. The ship returned to Sydney and Gladys's health minister Brad Hazard allowed all 2,700 passengers to disembark. Within two weeks, 662 of those passengers had tested positive and they then spread it to all the other states as well. 28 deaths have been attributed to the Ruby Princess spread. 
Later in the year, Victoria would go into a heavy lockdown to combat the spread, and when a cluster of cases emerged in Sydney around Christmas time, Gladys made the call not to lock down Sydney, but rather impose simple restrictions. The cluster died down, and for this, Gladys was praised as the woman who saved Australia, and the Federal Liberal Party routinely called New South Wales the gold standard of COVID management. Gladys would then more or less pat herself on the back for avoiding lockdowns. That, uh, we had the systems in place to be able to weather whatever came our way so that we would never go into lockdown again. But this would create a massive issue. In June of 2021, the much more contagious Delta variant arrived in Sydney and a cluster was emerging. Again, Gladys defaulted to her playbook of implementing restrictions, but not a lockdown. However, this time, it didn't work. Having branded herself as the woman who avoided lockdowns, eventually after 350 cases, she had to lock down all of Sydney. The lockdown lasted over three months. Throughout those three months, at 11am, Gladys would appear to give her press conferences where she explained the new restrictions and take some questions. If you ask me, the whole thing was incredibly theatrical and contributed to the cult of personality that began to be built around her. Those three months were also filled with plenty of moments of hypocrisy. For instance, in June, just before the outbreak, Gladys went on Kyle and Jackie O saying it was preposterous that Victoria would ask for vaccines from New South Wales, and then when Delta broke out in New South Wales, she went and begged Victoria for vaccines. Brad Hazard was asked what the health advice given to the government was at the start of the outbreak, and he flat out refused to answer. That's because on top of that, Sky News journalist Andrew Clonell said this about Gladys. Three New South Wales ministers have told me last week they believe that Gladys Berejiklian did not lock down earlier because she wanted to preserve her reputation as the Premier who keeps business open. Wait a minute, didn't you say at the start of the video that Murdoch was pro-Liberal Party? Yes, I did. But remember, they're not supporters of her faction. They'll certainly support her over Labor, but they'd rather have one of their own in the top job. And a year before, an opportunity had actually presented itself. So in September of 2020, in between the lockdowns, ICAC, again our corruption commission, announced that they were calling in Gladys as a witness as they investigated one of her former cabinet members, Daryl Maguire. In October, Gladys was called into ICAC where it was revealed that Maguire wasn't just her colleague, but her on and off again boyfriend. Seriously, it actually felt like an end of season Gossip Girl cliffhanger. Essentially, Maguire had fallen into ICAC's crosshairs in 2017 over a 2016 phone call between him and Canterbury Council when Maguire said he had a mega client, a Chinese development company, who wanted 30 development applications approved. Initially, the investigation was into the Canterbury Council, but because Maguire was the middleman, they later launched their own investigation into Maguire. He had been secretly in a relationship with Gladys since perhaps 2014, but certainly 2015, and it only ended a week before the investigation in 2020. Gladys actually sacked Maguire as far back as 2018, two years before their private relationship actually ended. ICAC played a recorded phone call, something they have the power to do, when Maguire told Gladys that he'd fallen into ICAC's crosshairs, but he pleaded his innocence. However, there were also tapes where he discussed how a deal with Chinese company UWE to rezone lands near Western Sydney Airport could hypothetically clear his debts. To that, Gladys famously said, I don't need to know about that bit. Gladys' defense was that she couldn't remember, but was likely bored and disinterested. Yep, six-figure hypothetical corruption deals that involve the person you've discussed marriage with are boring as. It's exactly the same thing as him talking about his fantasy football team, right? Obviously, Gladys's conduct was a clear breach of the ministerial code of conduct for not declaring conflicts of interest, her relationship with Maguire, nor reporting suspected corruption because Maguire wasn't actually being investigated over the whole airport thing. Gladys's defense was that the ministerial code of conduct didn't apply to her as Premier and that she didn't actually suspect corruption because she completely trusted Maguire. Who was she to know that he'd turn out to be a rotten egg? And this was precisely the angle the Liberal Party and the media ran with. Haven't we all dated a toxic guy? The Fairfax papers pumped this angle and Channel 9 let minister after minister repeat this line unchallenged. When opposition leader Jody McKay called for Gladys's resignation, she was portrayed as a nasty opportunistic woman. Just look at this coverage from Channel 9. Labor unrelenting. You, you are complicit in his your corruption seat. and his misconduct. Resume, you, Why you did you not call. fulfill your legal obligation? But the Premier got away a few punches too. You are in the cabinet room with people found to be corrupt. You are in. Like that is beyond misleading. Yes, McKay did serve in a cabinet with corrupt Labor MPs, but the difference was she reported them to ICAC and even paid for it with her own seat. 
Channel 9 completely left out that bit when in similar circumstances one acted with integrity and one simply didn't. So Fairfax's coverage was thinly veiled hero worship, but what about those crazy Murdoch guys? Well, there was an opportunity to replace Gladys with a more socially conservative leader and they pounced with some excellent journalism. Yep, you heard it here. So Clonell did what a free press should do and actually focused on the conduct. He was clearly lobbying for developers while you were Premier and he was a parliamentary secretary. Why didn't you act on this Premier? Uh, well, look, that's um, all your opinion, uh, Mr Clonell. It's but in I'll the evidence, this. Premier. Uh, but I'll say this, at all times I've acted in the best interests of this state. Had I known that any wrongdoing was occurring at any stage, I would not have hesitated to act. Uh, in fact, I acted very swiftly when, I ha when I've had to. And, uh, and I say again, I'd be the first one to put up my hand and admit I've done anything wrong. OK, well, haven't. you said to him, they seem to think it's in your electorate. I didn't say anything to my staff. Why was that? Well, at all times, I've maintained... Again, Andrew Bolt, Sky News' poster boy, was making it painfully apparent what Fairfax's angle was. Poor misled Gladys, the victim of a rotten bloke she's now dumped. Well, she just might survive a soap opera like that. And Bolt was actually right, as remarkably, Gladys survived in 2020. As the Delta lockdown progressed throughout 2021, ICAC announced their intention to extend Operation Keppel to now focus on Gladys' involvement. However, the investigation could not begin until restrictions eased. For Gladys, the lockdown was actually her last hope. If she could firmly entrench herself as the crisis leader, then maybe, just maybe, ICAC might back down for the stability of the state. ICAC didn't. And on October the 1st, a week before lockdown ended, Gladys announced her resignation from Parliament, saying that history will vindicate her. Then from the pod, a fairly apolitical guy, might I add, actually sent me a message to tune into the media coverage of Gladys, and to put it lightly, it was an absolute circus. And yep, now that Gladys was gone, News Corp went back to being pro-Gladys in preparation for the 2023 election. I could play you a highlights reel that goes for an hour. So after she voluntarily resigned, the biggest enemy wasn't Gladys or even Maguire, it was ICAC. In return, Gladys was eulogised. By the way, that investigation actually had nothing to do with the Badgery Creek rezoning. It was to do with Gladys chairing expenditure committees which gave a ton of money out to Maguire's electorate in Wagga Wagga. In 2023, the report was finally released and it found that both Maguire and Berejiklian were guilty of corruption, though only recommended criminal charges for Maguire. The report showed messages of Gladys conceding that Maguire really was the boss, even on expenditure review meetings, and the report concluded that there was no way Gladys could not have had any suspicion that Maguire was engaging in corrupt activity. The report also found that Gladys was an unhelpful witness, and of course the media, and even Chris Minns, whose whole strategy is to placate the legacy media, once again went straight into bashing ICAC for being too slow to deliver the report. You know what would have sped up the report? One, if ICAC had been properly funded, but two, if Gladys had reported Maguire's corruption so that they didn't have to waste all of this time trawling through their phone records. That the media went to such lengths to consistently redirect the public's attention to all of these other places apart from the facts of the case was an exercise in manipulation so great that people really started to see through the game. At every point, guys like Geordies and Michael West were vindicated, which if you're looking for Aussie news, definitely go to Michael West Media. He does amazing research and makes no claim to be unbiased. And I want to finish by recognising an unsung hero throughout the whole process, Jody McKay. While the corporate media were going on about Gladys being a female icon, there was one of much greater integrity across the aisle. In 2021, Labor dumped her for Chris Minns, who yes, is a great campaigner and likeable guy, but has been really weak on the whole Gladys issue. McKay rightfully called the corruption for what it was, and back in 2011, she refused a bribe that had been coordinated by power brokers in her own party and then reported it to ICAC. For that, they campaigned against her and caused her to lose her seat in Newcastle until 2015. I'd strongly advise reading up on that story, and you can begin learning about it right here.